Good evening. Welcome to the second in our series of BOFAS webinars aimed specifically at registrars. Um, this evening we are going to be talking about ankle fractures and ankle fracture fixation has always been our bread and butter. Indeed, the bimalleolar ankle fracture was always considered the training ground for orthopedic registrars. However, how to manage an ankle fracture has always been based in a mixture of experience, tradition and myth. So tonight, BOFAS Education Committee has chosen this evening's topic and this evening's speakers for their relevance to the topic and for the experience of the speakers, who have both been on a quest to apply science to start to define what makes an ankle fracture unstable. So tonight we're going to talk specifically in two areas, the posterior malleolus fracture and the syndesmosis. Our distinguished speakers are Andy Malloy, Senior Foot and Ankle Consultant and Honorary Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Liverpool, and uh, Professor Lyndon Mason, who uh, has been awarded the Hunterian Professorship this year for his distinguished work. Right, I'd like to present to you our work on the evolution of posterior malleolar fracture classification systems and treatment algorithms. Um, for this, there are huge amounts of acknowledgements for uh, an, an East Kadakia in Chicago to the anatomists at uh, the uh, University of Liverpool, as well as the, um, uh, the registrars and core trainees who've been through our departments and helped with the large amounts of research that's gone into this. So I'm going to go through the background, uh, the science behind treatment strategies, the classification system that we came up with, the treatment algorithm that came through this and what our eventual outcomes were. So I'll start with a bit of background on the first work that we did on ankle fractures. So back in 2011 really it was starting to feel as if we were having to revise quite a few ankle fractures. So we did a prospective audit looking at this and actually uh, disappointingly what we found is that there was a 33% malreduction rate with an overall complication rate of 9%. Um, now obviously this was far from ideal so we went through the typical scenario that happens in departments as we went through a period of re-education which use things like uh, uh, audit and induction and such like. So after this period of re-education, we then re-audited in a prospective fashion. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this showed that there was a malreduction rate had actually deteriorated. So it was 44% with a higher percentage of uh, overall complications. Now, it was only afterwards that we realised through further reading is when you looked into the basis of education and the psychological aspects behind it, is that education through uh, uh, emphasising uh, negative points is doomed to failure. And actually, uh, Cialdini's work on this show that it's normalization of poor behavior so what was actually necessary was uh, overall system change now these were uh, uh, numerous so they included specialist foot and ankle clinics specialist foot and ankle trauma lists ease of referral patterns and us being happy to take any of the fractures that people didn't feel as if they wanted to fix themselves now as you can see from the results that we had from this is it was a great difference is the malreduction rate went down to three percent and this three percent was actually understandable for how complex the fractures were and there was a very low overall complication rate so when i first presented uh, the first two audits uh, both nationally and internationally is that there was criticism leveled to me maybe it's just that your department isn't very good you're just doing it badly now we actually implore people to go and check through their own results and actually this is what happened and there were multiple presentations from eminent departments which showed almost pretty exactly the same results so i think this really um goes to show that it's necessary that we all check our results going forward so leading on from this we wrote up our results together with leicester now, what we found is if you took all fractures and split them into fracture types and did OMAS scores on them, is that um, 
by far and away the, the worst, and this was statistically significant, were the B3 fractures. Now these are the posterior malleolar fractures and they are significantly worse. So we felt as if that might be an area in which we could make some great improvement. So back when I was revising for my exam, certainly we were taught that if it's less than a third, don't fix it, just not necessary. So part of the basis of a lot of our research is taking things which are said to be true and held in regard that that is the definite way of doing it, and going back and checking the references, actually seeing whether it is true. So if you follow the rabbit hole down through lots of cross-referencing to find out where the original reference for this is, it's from that well-known orthopedic journal, the uh, Journal of Surgery, Gynecology and Obstetrics from 1940, where they looked at uh, a whole nine cases, which I think the degree isn't a good starting point for uh, a treatment basis. So even going up to 2011, uh, opinions hadn't changed that that much is that if it was 50% everyone would do but if it was 20% only 44% of respondents would uh, actually go ahead and fix that. So if we back up just a little what is a third anyway? So there's actually a whole plethora of literature out there which says that radiographs are unreliable at looking at the posterior malleolar fractures. So one paper showing that the diagnostic accuracy was only 22%. Others showing that CT changed surgical management in a large percentage of cases. Um, the fracture uh, uh, fragment, which is far worse to visualize, are the postromedial fractures, which are extremely difficult to visualize. So if we just take some examples here, here we can see that there's a small slither off the back and that's actually correct. But the reason that's correct is because the, the x-ray beam is, go, is going through the fracture site. If we go to this uh, 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 next example, is that you can see there's a potential of a, a small step there, but it's difficult to it's difficult to see and that is this is a 2a fracture with a large postrolateral uh, uh, fracture which involves articular surface but because the x-ray beam isn't going through it is that you cannot see it accurately if we go to this uh, uh, third example we can see that there's one big chunk off the back However, when we CT this is, yes, there is a big chunk off the back here that, that with the x-ray beam going through, but the large posture medial fragment cannot be visualized on this. So for a final example, we can see that there's a, 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 an oblique lateral malleolar fracture, and there looks to maybe be a fragment there, but there's not much else on the lateral. But this is actually a really severe ring avulsion fracture of the, uh, uh, of the ankle with pretty much all ligaments disrupted. And if one obviously just fixed the lateral malleolus on this, is that you would still end up with a grossly unstable ankle. And this is the CT which backs this up. So we now CT all posterior malleolar fractures, and I would implore you to do this, and it doesn't matter how small the flake, but it looks on the lateral radiographs. So the original classification was done by Haraguchi, and it, it, it's a nice classification, but it doesn't go stepwise in progression of severity and there's no treatment algorithm attached to this. So we felt as if we could maybe improve on this because we felt that there were several types which were grossly different and should therefore will be managed as such. So we took 120 consecutive um, CT scans to base our, our classification system on. So this is from our publication in FAI. So you've got your type 1s, which is the PITFL emulsion, your type 2s, which are rotational pilons, and these have two, has two subsets, and the type 3 are your true posterior pilons. So this is how they correlate with other uh, classification systems which have been uh, proposed. So I'll go through each one of these 
step by step. So the type one is your PITFL evulsion. So we can see here a typical inversion injury. And as this happens, the PITFL evulses off uh, the postural corner as well as a rim going across. Now with these injuries, what we found is all of them had a, a, a syndesmosis injury. Now three quarters of those were a full syndesmosis diastasis. The other quarter were just simply posterior syndesmosis, and I'll go on to this later on in the talk on how we determine that. You see on the bottom line is that the majority didn't have medial malleolar ankle, uh, medial malleolar fractures as well. So for the type two, that's a posterior, uh, that's a rotational P-log. So here we can see that there is external rotation of the talus, and as this happens, it knocks off the posterolateral corner. And if it rotates further, is that you get an extension, uh, a second fracture line extending across. So that becomes a two-part posterior fracture. And this was backed up on the CT scans, which showed that there were fragments which were um, uh, reproducible size and anatomy. So you can see on the left-hand side, you've got the 2A in one part, and on the right-hand side, you've got the 2B, which is in two parts. So with these, there is less incidence of diastasis injury, about one in two, and there are more medial malleolar fractures that occur with these. There have been a couple of papers which have shown that if you do need to fix the syndesmosis in these, there is far greater stability if you fix the posterior malleolus as well as dealing with the syndesmosis, and it is also more accurate. So going on to the type threes now, is the type three is your true posterior pilon. Now this occurs with a plantar flexed foot with axial loading, and this causes a shear force which shears off a large chunk of the posterior part of the plafond with displacement. And we can see from this schematic that there's a high chance of getting some chondral injury as well. Now with these, we found that the syndesmosis was stable the majority of the time, but that the majority had a medial malleolar fracture, and these tended towards the more complicated types of medial malleolar fractures. And CT is going to be really necessary to determine what metal work you're going to put in that. So a real take-home message here. So the type 1 is a PTIFL avulsion which will, have, will always have some degree of syndesmosis injury, whether that's full syndesmosis or just the posterior part. Your 2A is a rotational pilon, which has got a one in two chance of uh, syndesmosis injury, but also involves some articular surface. And the type three is an axial loaded true posterior pilon, which has got a much higher chance of having a complex medial malleolar fracture, as well as having some chondral injury. So what is our algorithm? Well, the type one needs some form of syndesmotic fixation. Type 2A is that postural corner, and that can be fixed from the back via a postural incision. Now for the 2B, which incision is used is either, if it only extends across the posterior surface, a posteromedial uh, uh, incision will suffice. If it extends further medially going up towards the anterior surface of the tibia is that you'll need a posterolateral and a medial posteromedial incision. Now that medial posteromedial incision is just uh, behind the medial border of the tibia in front of tibialis posterior. The posteromedial incision uh, is just the medial side of the Achilles and the posterolateral you can either do just lateral to the Achilles or in between the sural nerve and the perineals. Your type three, you can always get to through a posteromedial incision. So how did we determine this? Which this was another piece of work that we did looking at what could be visualized on the back of the tibia from each one of these incisions. So this was done on uh, uh, um, at least 10 cadavers. And we did the, uh, excision, the incision and the exposure and then put K-wires at the limits of what we could see and then took radiographs and then we could perform these schematics to show that for what incisions were necessary for each type of fracture. So 
how do we go on to treat these? Well, for the type one is you can see this rim, which has been taken off with PITFL, and that will need syndesmosis fixation. So this one actually had a medial malleolar fracture, so that's been fixed, plus the lateral malleolus in the standard fashion with a syndesmosis screw. Lyndon will go on more about the syndesmosis afterwards. So to show what we mean about the uh, 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 posterior syndesmosis injuries, normally you'd carry out a hook test or more commonly an external rotation test to check whether the syndesmosis is intact. Now, if you do this with a posterior syndesmosis injury, you won't see any difference. So there will be no difference on external rotation test. However, if you internally rotate the foot, is that you'll see all the signs of syndesmosis injury with decreased tibia fibula uh, overlap and an increase in syndesmosis diastasis. So with these injuries, do your external rotation test. If that is normal, you must do your internal rotation test. And here you can see this abnormal test is negated by putting a screw across. So we need to be careful when we place our clamp and when we place a screw that we maintain the accuracy of reduction. So here we can see where clamp's been placed nicely, screw placed across, and that will heal well. If you over tighten it, you'll sublux the fibula posteriorly. And if you really over tighten it, you really can get that out the back and put the screw across the fracture site. Now you say, well, well that's going to be impossible to do. But here's an example from a, uh, a paper in 2009 from FAI. So going on for treatment of the type 2As, the, the more minor rotational p lines, is that we fix all of these pro. Now it takes a bit of getting used to to fix the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus, but it, 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 it quickly becomes second nature. So with these, we're going to want to fix them through a postural lateral incision. So we put them in the prone position with the affected leg elevated so we can see that postural lateral side nicely. And if we need to take out this bump, to fix the medial side, so be it. And here you can see a fairly standard uh, 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 postural lateral corner fracture. And this has been fixed with some compression screws and a buttress plate. Now there is a full syndesmosis injury and a tight rope has been used in this case. For the type 2B, which is a more major rotational pilon, we want to get to the postural medial side or the medial posture medial, as I said before, so that we can fix this. So they're in a semi-prone, almost like recovery position, with the unaffected leg raised, and this one down on the operating table. And this provides more than adequate access. So the important thing if you're fixing one of the two Bs is if you fix this lateral corner first, what will tend to happen is as you compress it up is it will squeeze out here and it will squeeze this posture medial corner out. So you must do the medial side first. To reiterate, you must fix the posture medial part first and then the posture lateral. So these are fairly typical uh, 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 x-rays and CT carried out. And this has been fixed with two uh, uh, cannulated screws and an anti-glide plate, as well as standard fixation of the other fractures. Now this one is what I was referring to with the more medial, uh, uh, the, the more medial fragment. So you can see this double shadow here. Now this means that the, the posture medial fracture is extending around past the median line up towards the anterior surface. And this is backed out on the CT scan where you can see it exiting out here. So for this, the medial posture medial incision at the medial border of the tibia, just in front of tibialis posterior, and you can stick a buttress plate on that to fix that down nicely, and then fix the rest of the fractures as uh, we said before. And this one actually had a syndesmosis injury, so this one actually got a tight rope as well. So for the type threes, the true posterior pilons, well, we need to fix those as you would do for an anterior pilon, get them back anatomically. And you can always access these through a posture medial incision. Now, as I said before, when talking 
about these type of fractures, you tend to get some more complicated medial malleolar fractures. So we can see quite a lot of comminution at the top and that there is a, a, a vertical shear fracture. So this has been fixed. You fix the posterior parts first, and then we'll fix the medial malleolus afterwards. Now, for all of these, you need to fix the posterior part first, because if you go and fix the fibula, you cannot see the posterior part at all, and it's very difficult to see whether it's reduced or not. So what were our results? So this is the initial study uh, done with Leicester, from, uh, 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 which was uh, presented at both us in 2016 and it ha has been published. And this showed that there was an average OMAS scores in these fractures of 54. With our treatment algorithm, this has improved to 74. So what this means is that it is now equivalent to a bimalleolar ankle fracture in their outcomes. And that's why I would highly recommend that you follow this classification system and the treatment algorithm that's been derived from it. So if you split it up into subtypes, is that you see the type 1, 2A, 2B are identical. The type 3, which is the true chondral injuries, are slightly worse as one would expect. So we're not alone in showing that these posterior malleolar fractures should be fixed. And you can see that there are eight other papers from level 2 to level 4 showing functional results equivalent to bimalleolar fractures with fragment-specific fixation. So, to summarise, the historical treatment of posterior, medial, uh, uh, posterior malleolar fractures resulted in poor outcomes. Size does not matter for treatments as all of them will require treatment in some way. And CT is necessary to determine the right treatment algorithm, the right approach and the right type of metal work to put in. And again, we'd strongly advise that you fix them as per the treatment algorithm. Thank you.